Okay, sorry for all of this. Welcome to the uh, informatics seminar. On uh, the theme has more or less become large language models, GPT, and grounding. Uh, and today I'm be talking. I'm going to be talking about the surprising, the surprising success for all of us who, who admitted of uh, Chat GPT. Uh, there are us, there are those of us who have strong reasons for believing that Chat GPT is doing what it's doing without understanding. Then there are those who believe that Chat GPT. He does it with understanding. And uh, there are reputable people in both sides. In fact, the two of the three godfathers of, of um, AI, or I, I've forgotten what the Turing uh, Prize was for, uh, Joshua Bengio and Jeffrey Hinton, both believe that Chad GPT understands. understands. Jan Le Kuhn, it's not clear. And, uh, both, I think, I can, I think Joshua Bengio can be said to also believe that eventually, and he agrees that it's not grounded now, but eventually it will be grounded. We'll talk about what grounding is shortly. Um, it will be grounded by the same means that it uses now to negotiate the uh, landscape of words. I have a different view on this. I think that ChatGPT doesn't understand, and that the reason it does not understand is because it's not grounded. We'll talk about what that means in a moment. And that you cannot get it grounded by the same means that you use for its remarkable success. But I do agree that its success is remarkable. And in order to say with confidence that it doesn't understand, despite what it can do, um, we need some explanation for how it could do so well without grounding. And that's what this talk is going to be about. I'm going to give you six, I don't even want to call them hypotheses. I, I'm going to give you six hunches as to, um, as to how it would be possible for a uh, Computer program and a database, basically. A computer program and a database. The database is huge. It's distributed across many um, um, computers all over the planet. And it got its data from a huge, huge, huge text uh, source. Uh, lots of things from the internet, lots of things from written work, journal articles, books, etc. So all those words in context with the words that go come with them are stored and part of this entity about which we're asking, does it or doesn't it understand, but which we have to uh, admit that it certainly behaves in many ways as if it does understand remarkably. Sometimes it does stupid things, but we do stupid things as well. So even understanding um, humans do stupid things. So it's not clear that it's mistakes which are getting less and less and being corrected better and better where there's mistakes are grounds for saying that it does understand and it, either it doesn't need grounding or it already has grounding. These are the questions I'm going to be talking about. I have six hunches, not hypotheses, not, 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 uh, not uh, substantive, well, I should say not empirical enough yet to be called hypotheses, but they're hunches. And it'll plant a seed in your mind as to why it is that this remarkable capacity, surprising to anybody who admits it, that how this capacity emerges from the means at the disposal of Chad GPT and of LLMs and the database that they have. Um, it concerns the question of meaning and understanding. So I'll be speaking a little bit about language. And my answer. My, my hunches will take the form that it doesn't understand, it's not grounded, but there are, at the scale of LLMs, biases or convergent, benign biases or convergent constraints at that scale, which partly at least explain its remarkable, unexpected, and 
rather astounding success. So the first thing I want to remind you is that uh, the original proposal by Alan Turing in 1950 was for a what we would today call a chatbot that can be interacted with just by texting. And uh, the, the test, the, the so-called Turing test was if and when you reach the point where a, a, a computer can generate chatbot capacities that are indistinguishable from those of a real human um, under, meaning and understanding person. And when I say indistinguishable, I don't mean just for a 10 minute Loebner prize, which, you, which used to be taking place for about 15 years uh, to see who, which, which computer program can fool the 75% of the judges for 10 minutes. That's not the Turing test. Anyone that you have not met in person and not, and, and not Zoom, you, anyone whom you have just texted with, nothing else, just texted with, is the Turing test for you and for that individual. You are interacting verbally, you're interacting, interacting by text, if you want to specify. And if you cannot tell it apart from a real person, if you have no reason to say this is not a real person, on the basis of its performance, then it passed the Turing test. And from the point of view of cognitive science, it is one, not necessarily the, but it's one of the viable models for how it is that the human mind understands and speaks and means. That's Turing's criterion and Turing's um, uh, in, uh, Turing's method and his criterion. The method is verbal only, uh, and the criterion is total, well, equivalence in, in performance capacity and verbal performance capacity and indistinguishability from a real person. Now, the first question to ask is, has chat GPT, such, such, such as it is, passed this? And the answer is yes and no. It hasn't because it tells you right away, I'm not a person. <laughs> so uh, the, the test can't work because it, he tells you the truth. Another person, and he tells you exactly what it is that he is. He's a, he's a, uh, a computer program and a huge database and uh, a lot of parameters that uh, that are stored in many computers all over the planet. So it's not it's not exactly what uh, Turing had in mind. It is not one Turing machine, one immense powerful Turing machine uh, that that simply has verbal capacity. It is in fact many 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 computers that have not only lots of capacities, statistical uh, um, learning capacities and so on, and, uh, but, but it, it, also, it also has um, a, Yeah, and it, it also has a capacity to uh, to uh, interact with everybody about questions that they have about just about anything they would ask from a from a, from a library of ref reference, and it's capable of interacting with them. That took everybody by surprise, and it sounds and feels as if when you talk to it, it's understanding what you're Stop. saying. It doesn't uh, literally pass the original criterion for for um, Turing test because. It tells you that it's not a person. So you're no longer testing whether it's a person. The idea was, Turing's uh, intuition was, if you're interacting with it, you, you're, you're not being tested. You're, you're simply interacting with it for a lifetime, not just for one day, 10 days, uh, but it, in, in principle for a lifetime. And it never crosses your mind that it's not another person. You may never have met them in the old days when you had a pen pal overseas uh, whom you whom you simply uh, set, exchange letters with, you wouldn't see them. So if they keep on responding and interacting with you in a way that gives you no reason to suspect that it's not a person, then it's passed the test. And of course, ChatGPT fails immediately because he tells you, "I'm not a person." But the other thing that you have to bear in mind is that the two, I I believe that the original. Turing paper did not 
it was it was defining computation it was making predictions about what you could what what how powerful computation is uh, but it wasn't implying that the candidate can only be a computer i think uh, uh, now i call the, the ordinary original turing test t2 <laughs> is purely verbal but there's another version of it that's very similar but that's much more demanding and that requires grounding somebody close the door please? Yeah. the is grounding and that's t3 the robotic version of the turing t2 is verbal interaction indistinguishable in its capacities from a real human being for a lifetime if necessary that's the criterion t3 is also verbal capacities indistingu indistinguishable for a lifetime but also the capacity being a robot to interact with all of the reference of those words. If, if you say, um, I have a, a cat, uh, a cat sitting in my lap, come and stroke it, T3 can do it. And that's a trivial example, but I may be using it over and over again. The connection between the words and the world is made by T3, not by T2. You have to have robotic capacities to interact with the reference of your words and we'll be talking about that and we'll come back to the distinction between t2 and t3 because the essence of grounding is already contained there there is by the way also a t4 but i'll only discuss it in the discussion section if you if you ask me a question about it now yes t1 t1 <laughs> is a, a t1 is a a, t, a little t, not a big t. It's not a Turing test because one of the criteria of Turing test is total indistinguishability. T1 is a toy. You know about these toys, a chess playing program, a, a, a scene describing program, uh, uh, Siri, Alexa. These are things that are able to do a little fragment of what people can do, but that can't do it all. Turing insisted on all, and there was a reason for that. There was a reason because with a toy, like a chess playing program, there's the degrees of freedom are much, much wider. There's countless ways in which you can get something to play chess, like a computer program to play chess. Whereas if it has to do everything with, that we're able to do, the degrees of freedom are narrowed down to the normal degrees of freedom for an empirical uh, research program. The empirical research program of cognitive science is reverse engineering the capacity to speak, hear, and, and, and think. And part of that capacity is robotic capacity. Okay. So the T1 has is a, is a little t, and it's not one of the Turing tests. We can talk, but let's not ask questions now. We'll, 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 um, we'll cover that in the discussion section. So the symbol grounding problem, I, I'm going to give it to you in the mushroom world because everything's there. And the same questions that arrive over and over again in this talk about the immense bag of, of text that is in, in uh, ChatGPT's uh, head, if you like, um, how is that connected to the world that it refers to? Because those words are talking about things. I'll give that in detail. So on the left in this illustration, you see a word cloud, a bunch of words. And on the right, they happen to be a word cloud of names and features of mushrooms, which are in the world. So you have the word, the mushroom words on the left, which is what ChatGPT has, and you have the mushrooms on the right. How are they connected? I see there that one of the words is morels. I have no idea what morels are because I'm not an expert. But if I were a robot or a person who has who has seen mushrooms, tasted mushrooms, uh, tasted mushrooms that made them throw up, so they realized that those were that those were um, toxic, um, um, poisonous mushrooms. A person like that does know what the word morel refers to. They are not just a bag of words manipulating words. They're actually agents that are interacting with the reference and the meaning of the words. And we'll get back to that as well. In between the two, we have something that we'll also be discussing, which is a dictionary. A dictionary in principle defines every word in the language. 
So in a sense, just as it's all there in GPT, it's all there in a dictionary. The difference is that a dictionary is not an LLM. It's a very, very SM, a very small um, um, uh, um, bag of words. And the other thing, and this is true also about chat GPT, is that the dictionary is completely circular. Every word that you want to know the definition of is defined in the dictionary. That's part of the definition of a dictionary. But if you don't know, if you're not, if you're not initialized in some way so that you know the meaning of some words, then whatever you look up, whatever word, unknown word you look up will just give you a string of words that you also don't know the meaning of. And you can look up those words too, and you still get nowhere if you just stay in this vicious circle that is a dictionary and that is also ChatGPT. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that as well. That's called the simple grounding problem, how to connect words to the things that they refer to, them, if you like. Um, the hard problem, and I'll only be saying a little bit about this, it's the hard, the, there are two problems in, in cognitive science. Turing takes care of the first one or gives a, a method for taking care of the first one, which is how is it that thinking systems, cognizers, can, can do all the things they can do. Talk, learn, remember, uh, um, identify, categorize, uh, uh, et cetera. All of the things you can do, a thinking entity can do, um, including, including, for example, looking at this mushroom and seeing red. That's another thing they can, another property of a thinking uh, entity, but it's not something they do. Turing takes care, Turing is a really a kind of a behaviorist uh, method. He takes care of everything you can do, including everything you can say, but he doesn't take care of what it feels like to see red. That's the hard problem. We're not gonna dwell on that, but it's gonna be a little tiny component of one of my hunches as well. So I'll set that aside. The, hard, the easy problem is explaining how and why organisms, cognit cognizing thinking organisms, or any system that cognizes and thinks does it. And the hard problem is how and why do some of those systems feel anything? Um, now, here's the, this is also, I'm, I'm doing, this, uh, I gave this talk last week at Mila and I gave it more abstractly. I wanna give it very concretely now. With just pictures. Um, this is the mushroom island. Imagine that the, the uh, fellow on the left uh, is, has, was shipwrecked on a mushroom island alone. And the only thing there is to eat, which is convenient for me because I'm a vegan and mushrooms are vegan. Uh, the only thing they have to eat is mushrooms. Uh, and that sustains them. But some of the mushrooms are poisonous. And the, and the, and the, the shipwrecked person has no idea which ones are edible and which ones are not. So the only thing he can do, and cross his fingers that it's going to succeed, is take, take the very tiny little tastes of mushrooms and see if they make him sick, make him sick or not. And if they if they make them, he has to do that over and over again, make himself sick multiple times and nourish himself, nourish, nourish himself often enough to be able to um, survive until something inside his head, and we'll talk about what that is in his head, uh, detects the features that distinguish the mushrooms that are edible from the mushrooms that are inedible. All of that is done non-verbally. That's all robotic capacity. He's grounding two simple, two simple words in, on this island. He already had the actually, since he's a normal person, he can speak. So he has the word edible and inedible, but he, he doesn't know which, which mushrooms are in, uh, edible and inedible. So he hasn't got the mushrooms on this island grounded. So if he has to do it alone, he has a lot of risk. It's gonna take a lot of time and he's not guaranteed of success. He may not survive. On the other side, the, the, the same uh, situation, except this time the ship, shipwrecked person uh, lands on the island and there is someone on the island already, a professor, who knows what the features of the edible mushrooms are. So he tells the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, shipwreck person what they are. 
and the, and the condition for that to help this shipwrecked person, think about this for a second, there's something that's absolutely essential and it's completely, it's, it's fundamentally relevant to chat GPT. The other person does not know which are the edible and inedible mushrooms on this island. And he doesn't know, uh, but he does know all of the uh, categories, all of the names of the, of the features of edible mushrooms that the professor tells him are the features of edible ones here on this island. He knows red, round, long, short, stem, spotted, all of those words you need in order to ground on this island uh, the words edible and inedible. Yeah, he actually already has the word edible and inedible, but now he's grounding the one for edible and inedible mushrooms. When he was alone on the island, trying to do it directly by trial and error, uh, he wasn't interested in words. He was interested in features. Here, it's the names of the features that are giving him that, teaching him the category, the distinction between the category edible mushrooms and inedible mushrooms on this island. I'll take one second for questions if there's something unclear either here or in the Okay. If you're if you're on the online version, please just speak out aloud if there's a quick quick comprehension question you want to ask me. Okay, so I'll go on. The, the, all of the essential elements of symbol grounding are there. In the first case, it's direct sensory motor grounding. The robot uses its sensory capacities and its movement capacities to uh, sample in the environment, find the features of, the, of, the, of what he wants. And I should quickly, by the way, because I'm going to be talking a lot about categories here, define category. It's not the usual definition, but it is in fact a, a, a representative case of the usual definition. The usual definition is you know, classifying things, putting them into groups. That is useless for this kind of discussion. For this kind of how and why in the biological discussion, a category is a, is a, is a kind of thing, let me put it another way, to categorize or to learn to categorize is, learn, is to learn the right, uh, the right thing to do with the right kind of thing. And that's why the mushrooms are perfect for this. Okay? The, 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 you need to uh, eat mushrooms in order to survive, and uh, but and you you need to, you need to not eat uh, poisonous mushrooms in order not to die. So there's your there's your feedback, your corrective feedback. And if you learn it directly by sensory motor learning, you by trial and error sample what there is, and you get feedback when you do the right thing and when you do the wrong thing. Now, for those of you who are in, in computer science, this should already be calling into mind both unsupervised learning, where you're simply looking at the mushrooms and seeing what correlates with what, and supervised, in fact, reinforcement learning, where you're, when you're not looking at correlations between features and features, but you're looking at correlations between features and outcomes for you, doing the right thing with the right kind of thing. That, if you wanted an intuition for it now, for it now, that is direct sensory motor grounding. On the right, the professor is telling the verbal, the, 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 the verbal describing the verbal features of the edible mushrooms. That's indirect verbal grounding. And here is the core intuition to take home. You cannot have that you cannot receive and you cannot learn a new category through indirect verbal grounding from someone who knows, unless at least the words in the description are already grounded for you. you and that they don't, they could be grounded by indirect verbal grounding also, but it can't be indirect verbal grounding all the way down. There has to be some way to break that circle. That's also what we were talking about in the dictionary, right? The dictionary cannot be just going from depth, from undefined word to undefined strings of undefined words. There has to be a way to break that loop. Stephen. Yes. There's a question. Yes. Gary, go ahead. No, Steve has a question. He's got okay. his hand raised. A short question. Go ahead, Steve. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, well, lovely talk so far. I, uh, I got hung up on the very beginning, and I know you're probably going to get to it, so just tell me that is the word understanding. So Yes, yes, we'll get to that. Okay, that's good. Very good. I'll, I'll be patient. Yeah, you'll be patient. Okay, now, um, I'm now going to, so my, my hunch is that there's something happening at LLM scale that, um, that overcomes the problem that I just mentioned, which is that, um, that you can't get, or, or in general, you can't get or give uh, understanding of anything. I'll get to under, what understanding means in a second without already having some prior grounding. It can't be inheritance from inheritance from inheritance. There has to be some place where you have a, 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 a source. And the source is, of course, a source of uh, the, the ultimate grounding is always sensory motor features, the stuff that you can pick up by some other means than verbal. And it's, that's how you ground the, uh, the incredible astronomical power of words. And by the way, the, the reason that I showed this, uh, this uh, uh, illustration is because I want at, at LLM scale, the, the nuclear power of language itself is bared in a way that it is not, it's shown locally when we talk to one another, when you hear a talk like this, but it's, but it's, it's in its full glory, if somehow we could hold all of that stuff in our heads and do all of the operations on it that uh, ChatGPT could do. But even then, even at LLM scale, it won't break the circle. It'll, it, uh, just to anticipate, it'll break the circle for a learner if someone wants to know what the mushrooms, the edible mushrooms are and the inedible mushrooms are, and if someone else knows, they can break the circle by, by, giving, by giving the person a de de description or a definition in words that, they, that are already grounded for that person. But notice that they have to be already grounded for the learner, not the category edible, inedible mushroom. That's a new one. That's the one that you're asking about. But the features that, this, that the one who already has it uses to de define and describe it, that has to already have been grounded for the learner. Chat GPT is both learner and, and, and uh, teacher. Uh, and you should ask your, yourself, there's a, an asymmetry here. The asymmetry is between the teacher and the learner, the teacher has to know what the right description is. The learner has to understand the description because the words in the, in the description have to be grounded for the learner. Whether they have to be normally they're grounded for the teacher too. I mean, when you when you get told something in words by somebody, that person not only do you understand the words that they're using, but they understand what the, what the words that they're using. And we'll get into that as well. Understanding is a mirror capacity. Uh, understanding mirrors with meaning. You can say something and mean something, and you can and then you can hear that thing that's said to you, and you can understand that same something, the same something. And that's a mirror capacity, which I'll be speaking about in, in, a, in a moment. But here, what you what you you consider, what you should consider is that there's no way for Chat GPT to break out of this of the uh, uh, word word circle. All Chat GPT has is words. Chat GPT is capable of doing things with words that we can't do with words. Immensely powerful things because there's so many because there's so much <laughs> uh, infrastructure helping out. And so, and so many algorithms, computing time, et cetera, et cetera. So even if we had somehow squeezed that many words into our brains, we couldn't do anything with them. In fact, it would use up all the capacity we have for everything else that we can do for our ordinary everyday robotic lives uh, in order to even begin to do with our neurons what, what, um, what uh, ChatGPT, which LLMs are doing with their uh, word database. It would be much simpler if, if words resembled in some way what it is that they what, they what they refer to, and for now now I have to give you a few definitions. In a dictionary, you find two kinds of words: content words, which is ninety five to ninety nine percent of the words in the, in the dictionary. That includes nouns, verbs, adjectives, uh, adverbs. Uh, ad adjectives and adverbs are pretty close if they just have a little bit of syntactic. Different. So, announce there are names of individuals, proper names of individuals, 
uninteresting in dictionaries. We don't usually put in George Sanders in, in, the, in, in the dictionary. Individual proper names and category names. Those are important. So the 90 to 95% of words that are content words in the dictionary, they're a category name. They're also function words. The difference between a content word and a function word is with a content word, you can point to the thing that it refers to. Cat refers to cat, to cats. Function words like if, and, for, of, the, is. You can't point to an is. Yeah, but some people like um, uh, abs uh, gerunds, abstract gerunds in the case of is, they say, yeah, but you can point. Let's say being is some, being is a reference word. You can define the word being in a dictionary. And, and having gotten the definition of, it, of the word being, 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 there will be examples of being and examples of non-being. Very abstract. We'll get back to that later. But um, if an and is, it, is something that you, you, know, you have to know what to do with it. It's a syntactic word. You don't, you're not looking for its referent. You're looking for its use. And uses can be ground. Excuse me. Uses don't need grounding. All you need in order to give you, uh, Wittgenstein had a, an incorrect belief about all words, all content words and function words, which is that they are, are all just a, a way of using words. The meanings of words are just the way you use the words. That's true for function words, but it's not true for content words. Content words have reference. And in order to know what a content re word refers to, you have to be able to you have to know what its referent is, not the definition of its referent, which ChatGPT can give you, right? You say, um, you say, um, uh, yes, um, where is, uh, spontaneous examples always escape me while I'm speaking. Um, what, all right, what is, what is uh, the, the usual example that people use is, what is democracy? You can define democracy in words. There, it may be inadequate. You may have arguments about what it is, but you can, a string of words will get you started. And then you can start arguing about what the features of democracy are and aren't. And once you've got it grounded indirectly, then you can point to examples just like you do with cats. That's a cat. That's not a cat. And you can point to examples of, of uh, instances of democracy or not democracy. You can say what's going on in the United States today is not or is or isn't an instance of democracy according to my definition. So this distinction, hold it in your heads, content words versus function words are very important for the question of the grounding of ChatGPT. But in addition to the distinction between content words and function words, there's the distinction between words and propositions. Some people say, what does cat mean? But your, your, your elementary school teacher will tell you, you're not, the meaning of cat is, I'll tell you what the meaning of cat is, but but cats are not the meaning of cat. And pointing to the cat doesn't tell you the meaning of cat. That just gives you the referent of cat. What does it refer to? Meaning, and, we'll, and Steve Hansen will, will eventually get to understanding, but we're halfway on the road now because in order to talk about meaning, I have to talk about its perception production inverse, which is uh, about understanding. Is it's, excuse me, before talking about understanding, I have to talk about its perception production inverse, which is meaning. When you say cat, you're just referring. When you say the cat is on the mat, you're saying a proposition. A proposition has a subject, the cat, and a predicate is on the mat, and it has a truth value, true or false. Cat is not. If I just say cat, I haven't said anything really. I've just said, a, I've just pronounced a word. So my first hunch, <clears throat> Is about this, and I'll give it. I haven't got. I haven't set it up yet. Iconicity is a resemblance between the the word that refers to a, a, the content word that refers to a thing and the thing. If the word for cat were a cat or something that looks like a cat or a drawing of a cat, uh, you would have an iconic name. Oh, now I remember why. There are many. I haven't got time to explain it in detail now, but there are many reasons why neither. Formal language, oh, so like mathematics, nor 
uh, natural language like English and French, why the words of why the symbols of mathematics and the words of, of English cannot be iconic. You cannot reserve um, an example of that, by the way, the reason I put Marcel Marceau over there on the, on the, on the upper left is in, in miming, which is not speaking, in miming, you, there is an iconic relation between what you're doing and the thing that, that the object that you're imitating. Miming is imitation. And uh, language cannot be that. I haven't got time to discuss that. In this in this talk, but although if you look at the uh, in, in, interaction with Chat GPT, that's in the um, that I sent a link for. This is discussed in more detail. I can't do it in this talk. I know already from giving this talk at, at Mila last week that I haven't got the time for that. So I've made the distinction between reference and meaning. I've made the distinction between words and propositions. I've told you what it is about propositions that is different from. And my first hunch. Oh, I forgot to say. So upper left is Marcel Marceau miming, and that's not language, not speaking sign language. Sign language is down on the right. And in sign language, although it starts with, there's a little bit of similarity between uh, gestures in gestural language and uh, content content gestures or actions, uh, and, the, and they're referent, it doesn't figure into it. You can say in sign language everything and anything you can say in English or French. And the, the, the resemblance, slight resemblance of, of uh, some of the gestures to the thing that they refer to has been lost a long time ago when, when language first evolved. Just as, for example, there are onomatopoetic words, onomatopoeia, where the, the similarity between, between um, bark, which may in, in originally have been an imitation of a dog barking, uh, and barking is gone. It's irrelevant because in order to make all the propositions that you're capable of making with uh, all of the instances of a word, the iconicity cannot enter into it at the word level, at the word level. Now here comes hunch number one. What chat GPT has at the LLM level is not just words, but propositions. Now, the proposition the cat is on the mat, not only does cat not resemble cat, and mat doesn't resemble mat and is, etc., but the cat is on the mat does not resemble a cat being on a mat, and the mat is on the cat does not resemble a, ma a mat not being on a cat because we're, we're here on local terrestrial space. We're not in LLM space. It's just one sentence. The cat is on the mat, cat, and the mat is on the cat, the cat is not on the mat. Those are all just atomic propositions, which we can do uh, recombined in different ways. But at the LLM level, there may be, first punch, a benign bias that comes out only at the, as a structural, an iconic bias, the, uh, a, 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 a universe of, of propositions, not, not a complete universe, because not every proposition that could be said has been said and never will. But if you, as you approach that, there's a structure that could emerge from that or a, an, an entity with the powers of chat GPT with enormous bags of data and, and correlations in those to detect the same way or a similar way to the way that the uh, shipwrecked, uh, the shipwrecked sailor. Yes, the, the shipwrecked sailor can detect after lots of trial and error learning the features of an edible mushroom. The, yes, the, the, the features of predicate space, if you like, propositional space of true propositions and false propositions may contain a constraint. It doesn't give that, it certainly doesn't give you uh, chat GPT's powers, but it narrows down the options. And all of my hypotheses will be about how is it that the, what looks like an un, unnavigable bunch of options up there, how is it reduced to a point where it's a little bit less surprising that it can do what it can do? When I get to the sixth hypothesis, Chomsky's thinkability hypothesis, this will come back in its clearest form. Okay. 
So the first top proposition, the first hypothesis is there is prop, there may be propositional iconicity, not at the word level, but at the propositional level at LMM, LLM scale, which is not accessible to minor uh, uh, computational devices like ourselves. Another one now. Uh, up. Uh, we were talking about mushrooms. We were talking about their features of mushrooms that you have to learn to detect. One of the um, tools in the in the in the repertoire of in in the in the within the capacities of uh, LLMs and ChatGPT is something that's almost equally striking, namely deep learning. It's remarkable how neural networks using variants of, of, the, uh, of the canonical backpropagation back algorithm and then lots and lots of ramifications are able to do such remarkable learning, the learning of the kind that, that the, with the um, shipwrecked mariner on the left is doing when, when doing its sensory motor interactions with mushrooms, tasting them, getting positive and negative feedback. These neural nets can do that kind of thing. It's not it's not um, ridiculous to say that uh, a, a, a neural net could be the one that in our own brains, something like a neural net that, that uh, enables us to learn the features that distinguish members from non-members of the category by trial and error. That's the, the second phase reinforcement learning. So, and here comes another form of iconicity that is, that is not really iconicity. Neural nets, if they're learning a category, um, their performance changes as you give them trial and error training, first unsupervised learning, just to get the lay of the land to find what's correlated with what. And then when it comes down to brass tacks, when you're training them, which of these mushrooms, not what the correlations are among the features of the mushrooms, but which of these mushrooms are actually edible and inedible. At that point, the neural net will, by trial and error, weight more heavily what is correlated with success in the reinforcement learning and less heavily what is not. In, in, in effect, it's, it's got lots of candidate features, which in the beginning are all on a par. And even after unsupervised learning, where, where you get the correlations among them, you still don't know what's the edible and the inedible one. But once you start training it with reinforcement learning, the, uh, the uh, neural nets are capable of detecting and abstracting the features, the relevant features that will distinguish what's the right, what kind, that will give you the means to do the right thing with the right kind of thing. It will heavily, weight more heavily those features that are correlated with success, and it will downweight or even eliminate um, the features that are not. As a consequence, and as a side effect, Something happens inside those nets, which is uncannily, uh, uh, uncannily similar to what happens to real people learning real categories. Uh, it's something like, I, I illustrate the rainbow on the upper left. In the rainbow, we don't see, the rainbow we know is just, um, the, what's varying across the, the uh, wavelengths is just wavelength. It's, it's longer and, and shorter wavelengths. But what we see, is bands of color. Uh, there's a if you look at it very uh, very fine tuned, they, they do grade into one another. But if you take a step back, an equal size distance between two blues, two two uh, uh, wavelengths in the blue range, and two wavelengths in the green range, they 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 look about equal size differences. But if instead the very same difference is across the between two of them is between one on one side of barrier of the boundary between the categories and one on the other there's a there's an accordion effect or this that's what gives you the rainbow effect which is that they they look more of the bands looked at a certain distance look further apart from one another between bands or differences between bands and within bands that's been named 
categorical perception by by people who studied it in in, in um, color and then studied it in in uh, speech badaga is also a continuum just like blue blue yellow uh, yellow blue green badaga in phonology space is is a, a continuum but we do not hear it as a continuum. We don't perceive it as a continuum. We per perceive it like a rainbow. You know, buzz vary in their quality, but they're all buzz, and buzz vary in, in their quality and gaz. But when you cross the Bada boundary, the same difference, same physical difference, is perceptibly separates them. It makes, in the case of the rainbow, it makes the red and the blue and the green pop out. And that's because of the feature detector. And even in a net neural net that is learning features, and it can be learning features in a, in a very synthetic space, there is a side effect that occurs as a side effect of learning the category, which is that if you look at the, and I haven't got time to spell this out either, but what we see here in the middle uh, illustration is the representation of the act of the, let's say, average activations of pairs of uh, hidden units in hidden unit space before the neural net learns the category. And then what happens as it's learning the category and what's happening is as it's learning the category, these hidden unit representations are sorting themselves out. There's two categories here and there. There's two colors, I guess, are blue and whatever. They're sorting themselves out until at the end, there's no overlap anymore. This, of course, this is much more exaggerated than a rainbow. A rain and, and a rainbow is much more exaggerated than what, what we find in human subjects when they're learning a new arbitrary category. But it's the same effect. It's this between category separation and within category perception. And that's my second candidate for this. Whereas there's no way you can give a, 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 a chat GPT a sensation. You can certainly give it um, neural net data. In fact, it uses neural net data. So if if you're trying, if, but you're, first of all, supposing you're just trying to do a T3, you're trying to have a robot that can, that can uh, do everything we can do, including this kind of perceptual learning. That robot, if, it's, if it uses neural nets in its head, will have the, 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 this kind of separation effect occurring computationally. It's not perceptual, it's computational, right? but it's there. And it's there as a side effect of learning category. And we learned here that categories can be learned to at least two, way, where, well, two ways. One, one of the ways is in the direct sensory motor way. And the other way, which is to, to learn to detect the features with your neural nets, let's simplify. The other way, is to, is to uh, learn the features using grounded feature names, describing the feature. And those grounded feature names, and, uh, one of the, I haven't thought enough about this, but one of the questions you want to ask is, how can, how, it, what happens when we're teaching ChatGPT something? ChatGPT is ungrounded and it only has words, but there are some combinations of words that are not in its word bag, and it is capable, and it, when, in learning the word bag, it, it clearly did this a lot because it had in, in indescribable numbers of words, but it is capable of changing its internal representations to reflect, for example, what the features of a, a, a referent are. It has a word X, X refers to uh, things that can be described in other words, EQRS. And that kind of inter an interaction I think my second hunch is that kind of a verbal interaction, perhaps also in humans, but clearly, certainly in, in sensory motor learning in humans, but what's not been tested yet in humans is verbal learning, verbal grounding in humans. That can also produce this um, separation compression effect, purely computationally, making things pop out in a space that isn't really perceptual, it's just representational. But that is open, that is available to a creature like Chad GPT, second hunch. It, uh, related to the second hunch is we're talking about the relation between direct feature detection 
an indirect feature description. You know, all, the only thing I said about uh, direct feature detection is nonverbal. Indirect feature description is um, is uh, verbal, but the words for the learner have to be grounded. That I'm simply singling out that capacity as one of the potential uh, biases. These are biases that we're talking about. They're not. Right. They're not understanding. I'm not going to end up concluding that that uh, ChatGPT understands. But there are biases that are part of the landscape of large language models that could constrain um, ChatGPT to be more likely to say something relevant and correct. Um, now I want to get to uh, circularity. The dictionary, as I said, has can define every word. What you'll be surprised to hear is that you can shrink a dictionary to something much smaller than a dictionary. First, let me define a dictionary. A dictionary is a set of words with the property that every word in that dictionary is defined by words, a, a description, a definition, or a, yeah, a definition uh, of words that are also in the dictionary and also defined in the dictionary. That's a dictionary, okay? Uh, one thing that's not part of the definition of a dictionary is that every word so every word in a dictionary is defined, but not every word in a dictionary defines another word. There may be a, a terminal point where you can get to it by definition, but that word doesn't go on yet. It could eventually. That doesn't go on to define anything else. So with these terminal points that are defined, but not defined nerves, you can remove them from the dictionary. You've lost nothing. You can get to them from, you can get back to them from what's left. Uh, but you don't need them. And once you've plucked off some of these uh, def defined or not defining words, uh, you keep on plucking them. That, that, that reveals more defined but not defining ones. And the rule is always recursive that what you have left has to be able to get you back to where you were. And if you keep on going back, it, you cut it down to something like 10 to 20% of the dictionaries. As little as 10% of the dictionary is left if you remove all of these um, these uh, end endpoints of a, of a, that are reachable by definition, but no, uh, but, but but that are not needed to go further. So we shrank dictionaries down to this, and it's called a kernel, the kernel of the dictionary. But that kernel is not. So what you might want to say is, okay, so we have to ground that kernel some other way. No, not the whole kernel. It turns out that the kernel is still a dictionary. You can still define everything in, in itself. If you, if you followed what I gave by way of a definition of, of the way it was shrunk down, a kernel, can def, a kernel is a dictionary that can define inward and outward. You can define the rest of the dictionary. But it's not the smallest number of words that can, that if you know what they mean already, you can get all the rest of the dictionary. That smallest number of words is smaller, quite a bit smaller, maybe, uh, maybe, um, 60% of the kernel, uh, well, no, less. It's actually, no, sorry, that, that was stupid what I said. In fact, it's around a thousand words. And it's all of the, uh, there are a thousand words that can define, that if you know what those words are, you can define everything else out of them. With the same recursive process, you define something and then you use that thing that you define to define further things. Now, I have a question for you, a quick question. Is and this is we call this a minimal grounding set. Is a minimal grounding set a dictionary? According to my definition, anybody out out in virtual land or here? No one wants to commit yourself to saying it is or isn't a dictionary. Okay, um, it's definitely not a dictionary. In fact, it's the opposite of what I gave as a as the. Um, as a definition of a dictionary. And in fact, if it were, the, the, the way to see it, the proof, I'll give you a proof. If the minimal grounding set is the smallest number of words that can, from which you can define everything else in a, in a dictionary, and it also contains a word that can be defined by the a dictionary, it has to be defined inward as well. If there's even one word that you can define out of the minimal grounding set, then it's not a minimal grounding set. So the minimal grounding set cannot be a dictionary. 
A dictionary is a, is a set of words that, that, that in which every word in the dictionary is definable from words, combinations of words in the dictionary. A minimal grounding set is the smallest number of words from which everything else in the dictionary can be defined. But the, the minimal grounding set, that set is not a dictionary, can't be a dictionary at all. It's the opposite of a dictionary. And that's interesting. Uh, uh, the, the, another interesting piece of news is that inside the kernel, there are lots of minimal grounding sets. So it's a minimal grounding set, although minimal is always the smallest, the, 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 the smallest cardinality. Uh, the smallest number of words, let's say 1,000 is the magic number, if you're somewhere around 1,000, or a minimal grounding set, but there's lots of 1,000-word minimal grounding sets inside the kernel, so they're not unique, but they all have this property that if you can somehow, by some means, be armed with the, the, uh, the reference of, the, of all of those words and the capacity to to form a proposition, which is to say, you have you have cat and you have mat, and you can also say the function words cat is the cat is on the mat. If you have that propositional capacity, then you've got the capacity to define every other word of those words. Chat GPT is not a dictionary. Chat GPT is absolutely enormous. Okay. But I want to make a oh. Uh, a, a, a prediction, which is that if you try to reduce chat GPTs in one language, let's not complicate by using every language, you, re, you try to reduce chat GPTs um, a bag of words to a minimal grounding set, it will be the same size as that of a dictionary. Because words are words, and, and a dictionary contains all the words in a, in a set. Every dictionary definition is circular and it's approximate, and so it's you can always make it bigger, and it always depends on other words. But that's what we have when when we when we have when we tell one another things verbally, we, we can use the words we have to define the words, the, the uh, reference and the, uh, the, the words we don't have, and then we can understand the meanings of the propositions that use those words. What was I going to say? So I think that that chat GPT, which you can think of a chat GPT as a super textbook or a super encyclopedia or a super dictionary, you can always lengthen uh, the, uh, lengthen um, the def definitions of words if if, if a <laughs> definition by put together by lexicographers missed something about apples that we never thought of is a is a is a pomegranate no not a pomegranate the Anyway, they, something a look alike of an apple, is that an apple or not? That depends on facts of taxonomy. So there's lots of words involved in really defining apple so that nobody can be left with any uncertainty about what to do with this, if it's an apple or not to do with it, if it's an apple. Um, that can be very long and chat GPT is capable of doing the full distance. But I think it's minimal grounding set will be of the same order as the minimal grounding set of a ordinary dictionary that has to be tested but i don't know I, yeah that has to be tested so if the dictionary can't break out of its circularity chat gpt can't break out of circuit it's circuit out of its circularity but, it, but the fact that chat gpt is giving remember the asymmetry between learner and um, teacher the fact that gpt is the teacher or or us means that we're not bound by that circle. Whatever chat GPT tells us, that as long as we understand its words, is gonna work for us. Chat GPT, because it doesn't understand and its meanings are not grounded, doesn't need to understand. It just needs to be able to analyze its, uh, its, uh, its bag of words the, the, the way that it does for us. But the, but the um, size of the, uh, of the um, Minimal grounding set, even if there are multiple minimal grounding sets, is a constraint on us, and it's a benign constraint on GPT. Because in as much as any grounding set will ground its entire its entire vocabulary, that reduces for us it it, it doesn't tell us what uh, it doesn't tell us what new words mean, but it has the the um, the uh, definitions of all of those words within itself already. So it's not it's not become grounded, and it's it's freed from one of the um, 
uh, handicaps that we have for an unground words that refer to ungrounded features. It doesn't have any grounded features, but it doesn't need any grounded features because it's just doing its loop through the through the uh, through the word word circle. And just to to remind you about the, about the, the the magic of a dictionary definition, if your if your life depends on doing the right thing with a, with a zebra, which is a, it's a, if it's a zebra, you should approach it and 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 stroke its nose, and you have no idea what a zebra is. That one sentence that if you, if you already have a grounded word for horse, and you have a grounded word for stripes, and a zebra is a, a striped horse already gets you there. So for us mortals robots in the world, language can reach anywhere directly if we learn it the, the, um, the sensory motor way, this way on the left, and it can reach even further collectively if others can be our teachers. And chat GPT is the, is the universal teacher, if you like, because all of the texts are in there. So it knows what to say to us. You have, you, you have to, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is not only how does it sift all of that information out of its bag of words, but when it's getting a small, a small uh, hand, handkerchief of words in interactions with us, how does it sort that? Well, one of the benign constraints on that sorting is the fact that it can um, uh, arrive at the words we said from its minimal grounding set via any route and get back by any route. And that's that would be a benign constraint. And it it's a constraint, it's a it's a property, if you like, of dictionaries as surely as it is a property of, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, large language models. The other th the other thing, and this is related to the question about understanding and meaning, there we have, as some of you know, uh, certain neurons or certain regions that are active that are involved in imitation, that are active whenever I'm doing something or whenever someone else is doing the same thing. They're important for things like mimicry, vocal mimic mimicry, uh, copying uh, uh, da da Dali style, copying a, uh, an image. And they have a, a reciprocal relation with one another. The, the reason they're called mirror neurons is because, because there's something you can do. And I said the easy problem is uh, the easy problem is explaining how it how and why a, cog a cognitive system can do all of the things it can do. It's the things that it can do, and it's also the things that uh, doing them and also perceiving them being done. Right? That's a re reciprocal relation that we have in language, and we're using it, especially in the. Now I'm on the side of the of the hunches that say that say less about constraints on um, GPT than constraints on us. We're not accustomed to teachers being able to tell us something that makes complete sense to us while having absolutely no idea what they're saying. So we project onto them our own state. Our own state is that of understanding the meaning of the words that we're hearing. Now this chat GPT who's producing the words that we're now hearing or seeing read, understand, does a GPT mean anything by those words? We're just projecting that. It just has a circular bag of words. We have grounded words. We can trace our bearings back down to grounded words, and we project that onto the things that GPT does, says and does. Um, this has a slight connection with the, uh, with the I'm almost finished. Uh, this has a slight connection with the uh, symbol grounding problem in the sense that, this might be the hard problem, in the sense that uh, not only do we not only do we uh, see red when we're seeing red and understand the word red when someone says red, that's, that's red uh, when they tell us because the word red is grounded for us. We, we, what we see when we see red is still implicit in the grounding of the word that refers to the feature red. Uh, 
there's another property there, which is that it feels like something to see red, as I said, not just detect the feature red, but to see, to, to feel what it feels like to see red. And this, of course, uh, um, the ChatGPT doubly lacks. Not only is it not grounded, but it has absolutely no way to feel anything whatsoever. So it may be, this may have more bearing on our surprise when it says something that, that means something to us and our projection of the understanding onto it that we feel. And this may be because of our uh, mirror neurons. Our mirror neurons, after all, evolved in a context of living with other organisms and other members of our own species. And um, we're not accustomed to come, coming up to people who tell us and, and the cat is on the mat and don't know what the cat is on the mat means and all the words that are, that are around it. And ChatGPT doesn't do that either. So we project onto ChatGPT that capacity, but, but may, it may also be on ChatGPT's end reflected in its, uh, in, in its own way of handling words. The fact that we have mirror capacity is implicit in its, fact, in, in its, in its vocabulary. That in fact, the understanding and meaning, I've, I've caught chat GPT, by the way, contradicting itself in the same sentence. I, I ask it the canonical question, do you understand? And, and he says, of course not. I'm just a bag of words with, with, a, with an algorithm. I don't understand. And mm -hmm. then I say, um, do you understand what algorithm means? I mean, well, I don't understand. What is that? Excuse me. The way it usually goes is, do you understand what algorithm is? And he said, well, can you tell me what algorithm is? Do you understand? And he'll tell you, yes, I can tell you, I understand. So we'll use understand to refer to what we mean by understanding. And also, uh, it, um, it, it, in truth, it can be true. And it says, I don't understand. There's a sim uh, there's analogy to this with blind people. Do you know that blind people use the word see and they don't use it just for what it is that we have that they don't have. But they say, they, 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 they'll say, I see, and I see that. And often they'll use it for another sensory modality that they have by touching. But they'll use C for it because in our language, C has come to refer to visual perception primarily, even though they don't have it. Anyway, this is another potential constraint of the words of chat GPT that you would not expect if you just thought of it as a, a bunch of text written by people. I want to come to the last one, which has the, the flavor of uh, the, the earlier ones, which are which are about ChatGPT's constraints and not our constraints. Uh, you know that there's uh, two kinds of grammars: ordinary grammar. Every language has its own ordinary grammar, its own ordinary grammar rules, which are different from language to language and change across time. And in addition. There, here I have a, an example of a, one of these uh, tree structures that the Chomsky and linguists, linguists uh, like to use. There, there are, there's another kind of a structural grammar that also constrains what we say, what makes some things correct and some things incorrect to say. Ordinary grammar, I mean, you, you, you don't say, uh, the example I use, it's currently, according to current English language grammar, between you and I is wrong. Or if you want to ask someone a question, uh, it's wrong to say that uh, that's that. I, it, I, I don't usually make this mistake, and so I have to figure out a way. But begging the question, yeah, begging the question does not mean I beg to ask. Begging the question means evading the question today in English. But that could change as well. So these are all aspects of ordinary grammar and lexicon that can change from generation to generation. Universal grammar, on the other hand, is universal to all languages. Now, people have made a big deal out of the fact that ChatGPT was not taught grammar, was not taught grammar, and yet it speaks in, in, in conformity with the, with the rules of grammar in each language, ordinary grammar. I personally, that's, this is not one of the things that surprises me. We know that, that, um, that what ChatGPT Chat GPT says and doesn't say depends on the proportion of his big, the big gulp. It says it or doesn't. And apparently, the, even though there's a lot of 
grammatical errors that people make, ordinary grammar, grammar errors that people make, there's not enough of them in, in Chad GPT's uh, um, database to make Chad GPT talk like that. That's why so many students use Chad GPT to help them with their grammar and their, and their, their um, style, because although it's not a literary style, it's, it's really quite a good one for a student to use. And, uh, and it'll change students writing to that. And it, it changes it to that because it's, it's not dominated by agrammatical English. There is a grammatical English and French and German and Latin, et cetera. It exists, but it doesn't exist in enough proportion. And I make the bet that if somebody um, fumbled with, uh, um, fiddled with the uh, vocabulary of, a, um, of an LLM and put in a huge proportion of, of uh, uh, ordinary grammar errors, it would start making ordinary grammar errors too. That's a hypothesis. But it never, ever hears universal grammar errors because neither do we. Universal grammar, according to Chomsky's first hypothesis, uh, nobody makes a mistake in universal grammar because um, universal grammar, we don't learn it the way we learn ordinary grammar. It's encoded in our brains, it's inborn. That's a controversial hypothesis by Chomsky. I, I want to close with another hypothesis, also controversial, but a little bit closer to what we were talking about over here. He's, Chomsky said, there's another way to think of universal grammar, the grammar that we all obey that we never violate, or at least the only ones who violate are, are linguists. And here's an example of a violation of universal grammar. John is easy to please Sally. You can say John is eager to please. You can say John is easy to please. You can say John is eager to please Sally. But you can't say John is easy to please Sally. And that is not a violation of ordinary grammar. That's a violation of universal grammar. And you would never have thought of it. It, it takes uh, a, a Chomsky linguist to get to play with, uh, with the rules, hypothesize rules, and eventually generate something that violates something that looks like it's a rule of language. Um, Chomsky's second hypothesis is that the reason children never uh, uh, make uh, UG errors is because UG is not what is innate. And in fact, nothing is innate. Thinking is something that cognizing organisms can do. Thinking, the, the, the question behind all of this is what is thinking? And we think thoughts. Chomsky's second hypothesis about, about UG is that the reason that all languages vary in, in ordinary grammar, but are all of them are, um, uh, are governed by UG is because a sentence like John is easy to please Sally is not an expression of a thought that can be that, that we can think. It's an, it's a it's, thoughts can be thought. They're, they're, language and thought is not quite the same thing, but language is, is a is a system that can express any thought. And John is easy to please Sally is not a thought we can think of and and, and this, this awkward expression. Sounds wrong, not because it uh, violates a, a linguistic grammatical rule, but because it's not, it doesn't follow the, 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 the rules of thought. That's Chomsky's um, conjecture. And I think that you can think of all of the LLM constraints as being a little bit like that, like something bigger constraining language itself. And in the case of thought, even wider. The, the thought constrains language, and then language constrains countless other things, including is, is, uh, is, is the cat on the mat or is the mat on the cat? With that, I think I'll stop. If you're interested in the details that I left out, the link down here, I'll, I'll post this. The link down here is the link in which I discuss it in more detail with, uh, with ChatGPT. Uh, let me stop sharing. And we're open to questions. Hey, Stephen, I'm still waiting to hear what a definition of understanding is. Yes. Um, understanding is the uh, perceptual side of meaning. 
and meaning is the capacity to to uh, to uh, formulate a proposition with a truth truth value. Cat, the cat is on the mat is a proposition with a truth value. That's what it means. It means the cat is on the mat. If you want to unpack what the, what the cat is on the mat means, you have to unpack what cat refers to and what mat refers to. But basically, that's how you. Um, you uh, that's the concrete side of understanding, not the what it feels like to understand, which is also the, the hard problem, which is also relevant and interesting, but simply the, the uh, what is being done when you say the cat is on the mat. If, if, you have, if you're saying the grounded word cat, if you're a robot that is saying the grounded word cat, the grounded word mat, you can point to or draw or, or, or uh, give evidence for a cat being on a mat. And if you and if you can mean that, and you have the the, uh, the the capacity to understand propositions just as you have the capacity to form propositions, the meaning is just the mirror side of understanding. The, the, under, excuse me, the understanding is the mirror side of of uh, of uh, meaning, just as um, perceiving, uh, 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 just as making a gesture with your hand like this and seeing someone make a gesture with your hand like this is uh, our mirror. Is our mirror capacities? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit articulate, inarticulate. Uh, Gary, Gary, did you want to uh, challenge me again? I'll let Steve take a shot. Steve, take a shot. Okay, so <clears throat> I think I, uh, I think I followed this partly based on our earlier conversations over the last year. <laughs> And I said, I, I do think mirror neurons get blamed for too much functionality, and this might be a case of it, I'm not sure. But the, the thing I have a problem with is the evolution of your thought here, because you start out saying these chatbots are remarkable, but they don't understand. And yet you have conversations with them where it appears they're understanding, despite the fact that, you know, if you ask a chatbot, does it dance, of course, it'll say, no, I have no body, I can't dance. So there's a lot of uh, deniability here, but th there's a sense in which the exegesis that you and others are doing in this story, this projection story, feels like behaviorism. It feels like you don't have any internal mechanisms to actually point at. You don't have any, there is no algorithm per se. This thing uh, learns whatever capacity it has. And yes, it's learning to make well-formed uh, utterances that, like with anybody, if I trying to understand what you're saying or trying to understand what Gary Cottrell is saying, I have to project something of my own understanding into this story. And certainly, this is no less true of a chatbot. So if it was just a big database of words, then there would be literally no reaction to it. We, you know, AI did this in the 70s and it just didn't work and it didn't make any sense. And people kept trying to write parses in front of these large knowledge bases and it failed over and over with millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars behind it. So all of a sudden this little open AI place it has an accident, this thing appears and we don't understand what it is. But people like you are making inroads to it, but I still think I don't understand the distinction between saying it doesn't understand sensory motor things, which makes sense because it has no sensory motor context. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a very good distinction to make. But I don't understand the first part because so for instance, I spent a lot of time programming Python with it. And does it make errors? You betcha. Is it stupid about things? Yes, it is. But does it learn when I tell it something? It does and then it corrects itself. Now, I've had poor graduate students at that, so I, I'm always amazed at how ChatGPT reminds me of just a good graduate student who's learned stuff. So th there's a sense in which the sensory motor part probably is crucial here. And, and you know, in the next decade, we're gonna, maybe the next five years, we're gonna see a lot of robots with chatbots attached to their heads somehow. I don't know what that will entail, but again, this is all emergent. I mean, that the first argument you have to make is it's emergent. I don't know what it is, and there's no simple explanation. 
That's kind of a that's kind of a question embedded in a statement. I'll do. There's other questions, so I'll I'll answer quickly, and we we can always continue some other time. Um, I'm I'm not I'm not, I'm not a behaviorist. You can't be a behaviorist if you actually give or if you if you actually admit that there's some internal mechanism. In sensory motor grounding, the first kind that I described, the one where the, the shipwreck guy is using his eyes and his hands to detect the features that distinguish the edible ones for the inedible ones, that's at the bottom of it all. And it's not behavioristic. You need a mechanism for that. Right? The mechanism, one, one, some, one mechanism that looks like it might work, is neural nets that learn features. But that's all you need. The rest of it about understanding and meaning, don't for, an important property that I was talking about was the asymmetry between the teacher and the learner. That's what allows you to have these amazing experiences with Chad GPT where he's he's telling you something, he surprises you and he's able to even say everything that he can say, but then you interact with him and you correct something and he gets it and he understand he understands. You can't help yourself from saying he understands. But all it is is a is an illusory interaction between an ungrounded entity that cannot even um, distinguish an edible from uh, 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 you can't even talk about mushrooms or cats with from with you. You have the, your ground. You can't get rid of your grounding. Is there uh, giving content to every proposition you hear? For it, it shows you how amazingly, and that was what we were trying to explain today, is how amazingly much you can do that's like what you can do without grounding, without without no, without any of that. Not not the slightest hint of that. I talk in the in the chat with Chat GPT about bottom up meeting. Um, a top bottom up meeting top down somewhere in between as if that's what you mean by, by merge I think that's completely incoherent you can't take a, a bunch of um, words that are hanging from hanging from sky hooks with no grounding at all but amazing uh, LLM scale um, um, properties that can be used by the kind of analytic capacities and actually grounded discourse. Uh, I think, um, go ahead, Casey. Yeah, I, I truly disagree with you, but I'll bring it up later. I think Gary had a question. Okay, well, right now, Casey's next, Dylan. Yeah, Casey's next. Uh, um, thank you. Um, I'm coming at this, I'm looking at this from a little bit more- Raise your volume from, a little bit, just a little bit. Sure, I'm looking at this a little bit more from the computer science side. The, the way chat GPT operates starts with the distributional hypothesis of semantics. Semantics here in very, you know, loose terms, very scary quotes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I the, don't know about for others, but your voice is falling off. Can you, can you possibly get closer to your mic? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, the distributional hypothesis, is this better? Yeah. Okay, the, di the distributional hypothesis is what is the semantics that all of these models are based on. And that's just what is the meaning of a word based on how it's used in text? It doesn't read from dictionaries. Um, it, it, the, the learning regime for these is, is playing a game of guess the word within a context of other words, not in a physical context, but in a context of other words. And from that, it derives a distributional meaning of, of a word. Of course, that's ungrounded. I'm with you on that, um, but I can't help but think it's deriving some degree of meaning, especially for more abstract words. That's fairly reliable, um, and that's by what, some degree of meaning. I'm I'm waving my hands very vaguely here. I don't know. I don't know because they're they're vectors, and and I don't know what they're doing with them. But but the the history here is the first distributional models were just let's count word co-occurrences within a certain text window. The second, the, the then down, you know, a few years later, they came up with word de vec, which is the same idea, playing a game of guess the word with a simple model, the semantics here being a vector at the word level. But then down the road some more, we see more complicated architectures that are designed to handle the com more complex linguistic phenomena. That's what self-attention is for in order to compose, but they're composing vectors and who really knows what's happening at the level. When, when I say compose, I don't really know what, how it's happening at, with, with the models, but it seems to be doing something because it can spit out um, coherent sentences. 
So, but this is all the distributional hypothesis at work, just at more, with more complicated models, with more data, um, that kind of thing. So when, when I think about a vector or a tensor and I think about how that's representing meaning, I don't know what, how it's doing it, but it must be doing something. And it must be doing something fairly reliably with, with more abstract words, because when you talk about it, about talk with chat GPT about abstract things, it seems to do okay. When you get to more concrete things like mushrooms and uh, rainbows, it, it's like, I can only tell you what I've read about those. I don't know anything else. And that makes me think like a human who tries to learn a foreign language, but only tries to learn it through text, like reading something in your native language, then in the foreign language, the, the target language, and kind of learning from that. And you don't uh, kind of experience uh, speaking with native speakers or anything like that. And you learn the language, but you're still carrying your internal groundings that you've had when you learned your first language along with you. But I'm trying to get into the head, as it were, of, of a model like ChatGPT that just learns learns a language uh, abstractly only without having a body. And that's just something I can't quite put my head into. I'm, I'm in agreement with you that understanding here is probably not happening. It's, it's, and, and the more I try to explain to people, the more I find that I'm probably in kind of a radical embodied camp of, of cognition, even though I'm not a cognitive scientist. Um, but I can't, I, I can't, I can't explain why the distributional hypothesis does so well with these, but that's what's happening under the hood. The distribution, hypo distribution hypothesis is a way of um, putting some substance into the notion that there's some other kind of understanding than grounded understanding of the sensory motor, uh, sensory motor robot kind. And I don't think there is. And, there's, and, and it's not just grounding that's missing, of course. There's something else that we have, uh, which is that, that it feels like something to understand. And they don't feel anything either. But I don't, I don't, I don't know what, uh, what progress we can make. We, we start from the same starting point, Casey, which is that we're, we're both puzzled by how we know it, I know as well as you do what it is that, 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 the, that, the heart, that the infrastructure is doing and the algorithms are doing and the next word stuff. We, we all know what the, what the method is by which it arrives at its amazing performance. But the performance is amazing. And I'm, all I'm trying to do is give a few reasons to think that it may be a little bit less amazing than that, but it's still amazing. And I certainly don't think that the punchline will be that there's another kind of understanding and that's the kind of understanding. It's sort of like a native language understanding that you carry to some other kind of understanding. I, I think that's, I don't understand that. <laughs> okay, uh, Gary. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, what about the new uh, GPTs that have vision and language? I, I go over that in the- Are they the, grounded? I go over that in the long version and Joshua, yes, last week when I gave this at, at Mila, I brought that wait, up. He wait, said, okay, they're this not- the, Is this the short version? <laughs> this, is a short, this was the short version. Uh, Joshua said he thinks that the way all of the means that uh, ChatGPT is using to uh, to do what it can do so amazingly well, those same means apply to uh, to a sensory motor grounding, and he can apply them. He just adds on uh, the, the, uh, the sensory modalities, and then you'll then you'll turn ChatGPT into a T3. And in the longer version, what I said was, no, you don't turn a ChatGPT. You turn a T3. Uh, a, a robot into a into a into a T three robot by by bottom up, right? Um, you don't take a, a, a hundred million uh, grounded words already in a, in text in your head and then somehow send down feelers from that in order to find a cat or a dog. That's there, most of that most of that vocabulary is free floating sky hooks, and bottom, and that's that's top down. Bottom up is you start with mushrooms and their features and you try to eat them and they make you sick. And that's the way you eventually go by propositions up towards the sky. The two don't meet. There's no seamless meaning between top down and bottom up. That's an assertion, but I don't understand why it's true. 
it uh, seems to me that there are two paths, right? The top down and the bottom up. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the one, the top, the bottom, I mean, the top down is used by creatures like you and me that are bottom up grounded. And we can go to a dictionary, which is not grounded at all, and we can pick us a, a definition of a word we don't know, words that whether we do or don't know, and we come up with it, right? That's but but all right. So it's got this whole vocabulary. It's got you know English essentially already, but now you're uh, attaching that directly to perception. So I don't see why that isn't another path to. You know, uh, you could never have gotten up there without perception first. You need the reference in order to ground the propositions. But it knows the propositions and then it grounds them. That's that's what ground them. I mean, I, I look, of course, I don't. I agree that if you put a chatbot into a into an automated word waiter, it'll be smarter than an automated waiter because not only can it find find you and give you your food, but it can also talk to you about French uh, haute cuisine. But that's but but one of those is a trick. It's like 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 a lookup trick. Okay, I think we'll have to agree to disagree there. Okay. <laughs> that, she... that'll that'll continue a very long tradition. Lucien. No. Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, if I understand you right, in the ungrounded learning, which is. ChatGTP. It's ungrounded. It's producing the language it's, we understand as if we, it's grounded. It's because of our grounding. Am I right? right. So ChatGTP is ungrounded because it has uh, the other uh, kind of uh, training. You give the training and so it's ungrounded. Am I right to understand? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So we get the impression that it's grounded because we interpret it as grounding because we have grounding experience and so my I question for, yeah is no, it no, my no, question that. I, it's not i'm not just talking about the user illusion here i also some of the hunches were about why it is that it's really doing as well as it is not just seems to be doing as well as it is but, but yes. go ahead sorry yeah the question is for this ungrounded learning for machines and human you assume there has to be feedback there has to be reinforcement in order to ground uh, sensory... In order to learn, in order to produce anything, like for, for, for yeah, for humans, we have ungrounded learning too. As soon as you, we have some basis of grounded uh, uh, basis, right? This core knowledge. And then on top of that, we can have other ungrounded learning. And um, for ChatGTP, if I understand you right, it's all ungrounded learning. So you must give feedback. You must give... Uh, corrections or some sort of feedback. That's another thing. How do you define Particular, feedback? I wasn't really talking about how to train ChatGPT. I was talking about what ChatGPT can already do. And the thing that you said before that I can't agree with. It's not that uh, that you you have to ground you get you have to ground um, the minimal grounding set, and then you can start doing things ungrounded. It's not everything's grounded that, that's based on the minimal grounding set. So in other words, it always has to have the, the it has to have the ground. That's why it's bottom up. It, ha it has to be connected to words whose whose uh, sensory motor uh, referent is, is accessible to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but but chat GTP doesn't have access access to the grounding. And therefore, it's only doing the ungrounded learning, but we assume we seem to get the impression it seems to communicate with us as if it has something. It's just us using our grounding experience to ex to ex uh, to assume that chat well, GPT has that. Well, because even if it's not it's, well, our ungrounded experience, it's database. All of those words, all of the words where it's uh, uh, trying to trained to uh, predict the next word contingency, those came from our grounded heads. Well, what it used was a text, but, but, but once it's a text, it's a text. It uses the data in that text to do some amazing things. Yes, yes, okay. So my, my true question is for humans. Uh, you have said that a content words, you can have a basic minimal grounded set to learn. From that, you can go take off. Um, and then there's function words that are I would say it's not that easy to be grounded. So, but there are categories for function words, and children do get that. So, how do they, how do they get it? Do you think that's something that they also rely on the grounding of this this minimal set with the content words? 
And then from propositional, I, uh, I think it would help people if you gave a, a concrete example of a function word that uh, doesn't have meaning. Uh, yes, a famous example is in French. You have a difference between feminine and masculine. Of course, you can talk about some people like that, but children's early vocabulary is not clear. What they early exposed to when they learn it, it's all up when the object is defined in terms of gender. It's not related to anything about about gender uh, semantically. So, but it is a formal property that defines agreement in many languages in French, for example. So. How do you get that? And children get that um, distributionally, and that's shown. I don't think they need um, they need any meaning for that. They did any. They don't need any reference for that. This is at least what the uh, empirical results show. So I'm wondering, from your point of view, even for so that's just oh. just an example. Because there there are function words that have some relational meaning, but they don't stand alone you have to have some other things to help them. I just want to hear your thoughts about how children can learn. Do you think there's some grounding basis before they can even learn these very formally defined syntactic categories? I think I agree with you, uh, Rushen. I think that, that, uh, that uh, am I still there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I think that uh, uh, function words are learned and and I suspect that a lot of them can be learned by unsupervised learning, just by distributional means. Like, yes, they are learnable and they and they're learned. And I don't think uh, anything is at issue there because there's no they they don't need grounding. Function words don't need grounding. You just need just like uh, a, a, an axe, a, 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 um, a shovel doesn't need a, a referential grounding. In fact, you you need, just need training on what to do with the with the uh, the uh, shovel, right? It's, oh, a, it's okay. just Thank an you. instrument. That's very helpful. Thank you for your answer. Okay. Anybody? I can't. I, I've had a connection problem, so I can't see who's there. Is there an, another question? It says Ryan. Go, okay, go ahead, Ryan. I've noted that uh, ChatGPT uh, has a really tough time uh, with analogy and metaphor, for example. And uh, I just um, Want to know if is it because uh, it doesn't have like the perceptual uh, grounding, or is it just because like it doesn't have like the the capacity to understand uh, the deeper properties of um, object, or uh, uh, I would say like relation with other object in the perceptual uh, field. What was your premise? Did you say it? Yeah, it has it has a problem with uh, analogy, like and metaphors. Okay. In, let, in, let me. In, let me just, I'm not an expert in this, but let me okay. say that. I, it's alleged that it has a problem with analogies. I'm willing like to say that, and I'm sure a lot of other people are, that if it does, it's going to be fixed because there's nothing about analogies that cannot be handled the same way that you use all of the other amazing talents of Chad GPT. It's not a principled limitation. Anybody else? If not, I want to thank you for attending and i'm going to ask malika to stop the recording okay